Hello, good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening. Depending on where you are in the world, it's 10 a.m. here in Dallas, Texas, and we're live for another Sunday. I'm excited to chat with everybody today, so I'll give a few minutes for whoever is available to pop in and just go through a few announcements in the beginning, and then we'll get to the poll of the week, discuss kind of the topic for today, and then I will um, be open to taking any of your questions. We can talk about carnivore questions as well um, throughout, but I do want to take you know, just the first at least 15 minutes or so to kind of go over some of my notes. Um, so if you're following along in the uh, 2024 live stream journal pack, this is week seven, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And sometimes I'm like, what day is it? Um, but you can work with your notes for, for that week seven section. And if you're interested in supporting my work and want to download the little um, journal packet that I created for, it's for all 52 weeks of the year. And so you can do a brain dump in the beginning and then take notes throughout this live stream. Um, and then we do some journal prompts or some questions at the end to think about. Um, that is 10 bucks and it's on my website and there's a link below. And I also have a goal setting workbook that I'm offering for free right now if you want to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is new. And for that weekly newsletter, I am working to get out the topic for the poll of the week and the topic for the next Sunday's live stream out to the newsletter subscribers on by Tuesday of the week. Um, you know, prior to that Sunday. So it went out this last Tuesday. And then uh, the poll went up on Tuesday. And then we have kind of a few days to get some input and think about the topic and then we come on here live on Sunday and discuss it. So good morning to everybody. Carnivore Keith's in here. Good morning. Or wait, you're, uh, it might be good afternoon for you, I think, right? Um, this comment was here when I got in here this morning from Rob sending blessings from the UK. Thank you. Good day to you. And I know the last couple of weeks we've had more specific carnivore topics as, you know, the core of the discussion. And this week I went a little bit off of that because this is something that it definitely applies to, you know, transitioning to this diet, maintaining this way of eating, incorporating more lifestyle factors that benefit our health in conjunction with our nutrition. Um, but I didn't label it specifically carnivore because I think just some of your comments over the last few live streams, and um, I actually got a comment this week on one of my videos that I thought was such a great example of this idea of what our inner voice is saying, and oftentimes the side of our inner voice that's the critic, right? The, the, the voice that we hear sometimes that is telling us we can't do this, or we're going to fail, or this isn't going to work, or I don't have enough time. I don't, you know, and a lot of times it's hard to separate yourself from those thoughts and recognize that that's not really you. That's not really necessarily what you believe. It's just part of the programming. It's just part of what you may have been conditioned to believe, whether that's from outside influences. Um, well, it is from outside influences, whether they be social, people you grew up around, um, you know, all kinds of different things. And so, and, and so this applies to you know, a ketovore, a carnivore lifestyle in the in the sense that most of us were taught a certain way about nutrition, right? And we were taught that fats are bad for the most part. And well, I mean, a lot of this stuff flip flopped throughout the years, right? So depending on how old you are and how long you've been into this, um, you may have heard a bunch of different stories. I know I have, um, but it's kind of like that, right? So we get stuck in something that we've learned and we just take that to be the truth. And then when things come up in our life that perhaps aren't working for us or we want to change, we hit roadblocks when we come in contact with those belief systems that have been sort of installed in our mindset. And so I think this definitely applies to eating this way. And and I think it encompasses some of the hurdles that people face that aren't physiological, that aren't like having cravings anymore because a lot of times all that stuff goes away 
pretty quickly. I know it did for me when I transitioned this time. Um, but there were still these things in my mindset that kept coming back about being a sick person, about being, you know, not able to stick to this, about what it means to be an abstainer, all this kind of stuff. And I've, throughout my carnivore update videos, I've kind of talked about <clears throat> how I'm working through all those things. And so I thought this would be a good topic to come at today, even whether it's fr directly from your nutrition experience or from, um, you know, any other area of your life. And so in the poll of the week, I asked you guys kind of in a more broad context, just to see <clears throat> what you guys thought. So the poll asked you which group of thoughts, and I gave you two group options, do you notice most often when faced with a challenge or setback? <clears throat> Excuse me. So this could be any challenge or setback, right? Whether it's nutrition, um, sticking to this way of eating, or it could be some other area of your life, your career, your finances, your relationships, your goals, your <clears throat> community, whatever that is. And then I asked for your comments. So group A thoughts um, were examples of kind of more fixed mindset thoughts. So things like, I'm not good enough. I'll probably fail. This makes me uncomfortable. It's not my fault. I'm not good at this. I shouldn't have to try so hard. And then group B were um, examples of thoughts that are typically more so associated with a growth mindset or a mindset that's more open to possibility and change. And so those were I can get better with practice. I'll learn from this. Challenges help me to grow. I'm responsible for my own decisions. I can improve with hard work and my talent will improve the more I practice. And then your choices were today or this week to choose from. Um, so you could choose mostly A, like you feel like those thoughts in that first group are coming up most often for you when you're in a challenging or challenging situation or where you feel like you've had a setback in something, or you could have identified maybe with mostly group B thoughts. And then the third choice that you had was it depends on the situation, right? Because sometimes we might feel um, very confident and, and assured and sure of ourselves. And, you know, we don't, we don't have a lot of mindset issues or or conflicting thoughts in one area of our lives, but there might be another area that comes up for you frequently that um, does seem to be challenging. And then in the fourth option, that was kind of drilled down even more, like maybe there's one specific area where you feel like the, the group A thoughts are predominant, but otherwise you feel like you have more that group B mindset. And so I know for me, it's not always black and white. And I will tell you, this is kind of funny. I don't know if this is just how it is or if this is like meant to be. But um, whenever I choose a topic for this live stream, usually something will happen that week that will kind of test me or bring an example from my own life up into, you know, so that I can kind of look at it in my own personal life too. And I found like that I felt like that happened this week where I noticed, you know, in some areas of my life, I'm really more in that growth mindset section, that that group B thoughts. But then there's a couple areas that I just sometimes still struggle with thinking negatively or thinking very fixed or thinking very um, closed, like my brain will have closed minded thoughts that don't open the door for me to think through something very much. It like assumes something or it makes it, it draws a conclusion right away. And so I think it's really interesting. So we got 155 votes this week and the majority of you, 48% said you identified mostly group B. So the thoughts that are typically associated with a more uh, growth oriented mindset, which is very cool. And then uh, this was followed up by 28% saying it depends on the situation. So the third option, which is kind of where I sit if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, I'd say most often I'm I'm kind of in that group B category, but sometimes it depends on my mood or sometimes it depends on how much is going on in my life. If I'm really stressed out in a couple different areas, I can tell it's like, oh, it goes back to that group A um, base of thoughts. Um, and then the third um, the third ranking one was 21% with mostly A. So saying that, yeah, you feel like those group A thoughts 
are predominant. And then 4% said A in one main area of my life, but otherwise B. So I found that pretty interesting. And a few of you commented on the poll here about the difference between when you um, ate a different diet. Um, Carnivore Keith, you are one of those. Um, So I'll read yours. Um, You said when I was eating high sugars, yes, high sugars, carbs, and highly processed foods, A would have been my answer straight away. When I was keto, things did improve mentally and physically, but as I got along in the keto journey, I noticed old habits and thoughts started coming back because I hadn't really given up the sweet or carb foods. I was just substituting them. Now, I've been carnivore for 10 months, can answer with absolute certainty it's B for me. I love that. I think that's so fascinating. Treehouse Lover said something similar. Before carnivore, I would have definitely chosen A. Now that I'm living a carnivore lion lifestyle, B definitely represents the way I respond to curveballs and challenging situations. Less anxiety and more clarity to think through situations versus feeling like every little issue is the end of the world. Yeah, I can totally identify with that too. Mine's mine's getting better, but like I said, it kind of depends sometimes like on the week you're having, right? And um, for me as, as a lady, like where I am in my cycle, like that's the point I'm at this week where I'm like, I just kind of feel lower energy. Things get to me a little bit more. I feel a little bit more, more emotional about stuff, but like, like Treehouse Lover saying, like having that clarity to think through the situation, I definitely feel like that is a benefit that I'm experiencing as well, where, I just have that much more space to go, is this really, is this really me? Is this really what I believe? Excuse me. Or is it, um, is it just that inner critic? Is it just that loop that likes to show up for some, um, in different situations? Sorry. I always have a little frog in my throat when I start this. So, um, We'll check in here and with you guys. Carnivore Keith says it's 5 a.m. here, my normal waking time now. Nice. And then you say, I think it's passed, been passed down through generations. So then it becomes the new normal for the next generation. I, I agree. I think there's definitely like a societal or a cultural pattern that we can, that affects our mindsets too and how we think and how we react to things. So definitely a possibility. Um, Blair is here. Good morning. Good morning. Less junk, more health. Good morning, Nia. Hey. Happy Sunday. Or perhaps Monday, depending on where you are. Um, so somebody that commented on the depends on the situation in the poll was, um, Stephanie Davis, 777. For me, um, she says it depends on the situation. My kids have been on carnivore for about a week now and we had the worst day. Three-year-old woke up at 4 a.m. puking her guts out. Um, Eight-year-old refused to eat breakfast because it didn't include cereal. So just kind of describing some of her struggles and feeling like she's failing to please her household. Mm -hmm. And I can totally understand that as like a, a stressful, challenging situation, right? When you're trying to encourage your family to eat differently or your kids, especially when they're kind of young, you know, and they want what they want and they may be used to what they've been having. Um, and then you're trying to change that and it can be really, really challenging, right? And you feel like, um, you know, she says, I, I've been tired of failing to please my household. And so like, that's to me an example of a thought that could come up, right? Oh, I'm failing. I'm a failure. And I don't know if if I am should be drawing that line for Stephanie. Um, if that's really what she's thinking, like I am a failure, but I know for me and for other people, sometimes your mind can jump to that conclusion, right? So, oh, if I didn't get everybody happy the, this first week of doing this, then I'm a failure. And I know sometimes it can be easy to think that way. And so I think a few of you responded um, <clears throat> to, you know, offer some, some commentary on that. And, you know, I think 
again, from my experience and, and as always, nothing we're talking about on here is medical advice or health advice, you know, advice in a professional sense. This is all, you know, just information and we're just talking as normal people sharing our experiences and trying to support each other as we all move forward, learning more and, and trying to do the best that we can. We have the best intentions for our own health and for our families. And, you know, we recognize that we don't know everything, that we'll never know everything, but we're just trying to navigate this and figure out the best way to move forward. And so <clears throat> I know for my family, I, you know, our little one's not strict carnivore and because she likes to eat other things. And I don't think that as, as a young kid, like she's, she's healthy. She's super, super smart. She's very active. She's like, looks great in every way. Um, there's no reason to, I don't think, overly restrict her as long as she's not, you know, showing any signs that she's reacting to anything. And so I think anywhere on that proper human diet spectrum, as Dr. Barry would say, you know, can be perfectly appropriate for kids. And so um, as as far as what I do with, with my little ones, I'm trying not to force a specific way of eating on my child just because I understand that the consequences of that could come back to bite me, right? Because there's the whole idea of, of being afraid of food and being very um, apprehensive to eat certain things out of fear versus out of just understanding how the body works, understanding nutrition, understanding what we're designed to eat and what makes you feel good versus not feel good. And so I always kind of, when I get this question or talk about it with other moms um, who are kind of on the same path, you know, I found myself always coming back to the idea of education, like doing whatever I can to teach my kids about what is proper nutrition for our species of, of animal and what's the best for her. What kind of foods are going to make her, are going to help her body grow big and strong and help her continue to be smart and, and do art and do the things that she loves to do. And then what things are maybe reserved for special treats or they're just, they're things that taste good, but they're not nutrition. They're not real food in the sense that they're not serving your body or her body in a way that's going to produce the best outcome for her. And I, and my girl's only three. So, I mean, there's only so much you can kind of dive into, but you know, there again, with the mindset thing, we, we want to try to encourage the best behavior in the child, but also be flexible a little bit for life, right? Because we do live in a world that's bombarded with sugar and we live in a world that, you know, not everybody eats the way we do. And we're in the minority when it comes to that, I would say. Um, but I think on the flip side of that, there's probably a lot more people out there that are learning about this and are thinking about, you know, transitioning their kids to a more, at least a whole foods diet versus the processed junk diet, right? And being hyper concerned with with fat and things like that. And, you know, so I think there is progress moving forward. And there's um, more and more support, I feel like online <clears throat> for families and stuff like that who are trying to do this. So I know it was sort of a, a long winded comment on that. But that's that's a great example of something that's challenging, right? It's really hard sometimes when it's hard enough to do it for yourself and deal with your own mental chatter and try to pick out what is true and what is helpful and what is just kind of, you know, these these anxious or these ruminating or these depressive thoughts that come in and try to kind of sabotage what we're doing. And then it's that much more of a challenge sometimes to guide other people like that we love and care about, right? Like our family members. And so I can definitely, I can definitely understand that. And, <clears throat> you know, I guess to summarize that, just and this is what the doctors say too. Like when I talked to Dr. Barry, he he discussed this too. It's like doing a slow transition. You know, even if it takes you six months to cut out the Pop Tarts and the Doritos and the soda pop or whatever, if that's part of someone's current diet, doing it slower is gonna just make everyone's life easier. And um, so I feel like that's really a, a, a healthy approach to to think about and set your minds up mindset up around. So you're not kind of feeling really, really bad every time somebody eats off plan or somebody goes somewhere and they have something or you do or something like that. So anyway, um, 
Let's see. Let's Junk More Health says, we're trying to do the same with our baby and teenager. Not always easy. Right. And and that's where, again, I always come back to education. And, as, and, and for us as parents, as we continue to learn more and model that good behavior, model being healthy and how we approach our diet and, you know, maybe having a little bit of moderation here or there or having something like whatever works for you. And then just educating our kids as we go along. Um, at least that's the approach I'm trying to take because, yeah, it's hard to just like cut all this stuff off right away and be like, no more of this. And now you're eating plain ground beef or something. I just made yesterday um, like really good ketovore. It's almost carnivore. If you took the sauce, the red sauce out, it would be carnivore um, lasagna. And it was so good. And my little one just like gobbled it. It made me feel so good. And so there's always more stuff we can try to. I hadn't really been too much into um, like any kind of when I was keto and stuff like I never did the keto baking really or the keto treats. I did the fat bombs with erythritol and like those were oh those were a mess for my for my gut. But um, I never really got into that stuff. And so that doesn't necessarily cross my mind when I'm thinking carnivore or trying to do like ketovore meals for my kid. But, you know, now I'm starting to get more into that. It's like, how can I make lasagna? How can I make like taco night? How can I make these other things that are colorful and fun and taste good for the little one, you know, and for my other half, because he's kind of a foodie too, and he likes to eat different stuff. So um, how can I make this more fun and engaging by involving my, my kid in the cooking process too? which is what I did yesterday with the lasagna and she had fun cracking the eggs and, you know, mixing and helping me pour the batter and all that stuff. So, you know, those are just some tips that I have based on what, what I've been doing that seems to work pretty good. So Jay's in here. Good morning. Hi. And okay. I think we had one more comment here from the poll. Uh, Pesky Raven 239 said they chose B. I'm someone who's always eager to learn and improve. I want to push forward no matter what. I don't like to be held back. I was born with cerebral palsy and I recognize that I do have limitations, but I learned to walk three times in my life because of a spinal dorsal rhizotomy and tendon lengthening surgery. And I'm not letting that hold me back. Oh, that sounds painful. I know I know how it was like to be able to run a 5k and have, have that taken away, but I'm still going to keep pushing forward. Yeah, that's incredibly powerful. And wow, I, I can't even imagine going through all that. So cheers to you, you know, and, and that's the power of a growth mindset, right? That's the power of kind of taking apart this programming that is in our mindset And just all you really have to do sometimes is change a couple of words or change, like take out the the negative verb, like the not and replace it with the opposite. So, um, you know, just kind of a super basic example. If someone says, oh, well, I'm stupid. I can't learn that. I'm stupid. I'll never I'll never learn that. Instead of, you know, if you catch something like that coming up in your mind, it's like instead of saying I'm not stupid as the counter to that and trying to change that thought, you want to change it entirely to like the opposite of that. So instead of saying, I am something negative, you would say, I am something positive. And it, it doesn't even have to be like the most extremely positive version of that. If it's so unbelievable at that moment that your brain, you know, you just can't wrap your brain around it. Because if you're telling yourself things that you just don't believe, it's it's not really super effective. So the the art to doing this mindset shift and and coaching yourself or teaching your brain how to develop more of a growth mindset is finding that sweet spot of affirmation or, I mean, essentially affirmations or things, statements that you can write out, which is really helpful in your journal or put a sticky note on your mirror or I do them on my whiteboard. I'll write quotes or affirmations for myself. So every time I go by, I see it and I I read it and I repeat it in my mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, the art of this is to find that sweet spot of 
the idea or the the statement that you your mind will latch on to. And so in the example of I feel stupid, I am stupid, you could say instead there are there are plenty of things that I'm very intelligent at or I'm very smart when it comes to X and think of something true. Like it could be a hobby. It could be a way that you communicate. It could be something you did in the past. It could be, you know, an interest. It could be um, part of your career, anything that you can find that is true. Like, yeah, I really am smart at this, or I'm intelligent at that. Or I, I, um, I showed a, a great degree of one of those characteristics at this moment in time in this situation. And that leads to kind of the process of anchoring, which is uh, a tenant of, of or a process in NLP, which is trying to you go through a, a series of steps to kind of anchor your state. You bring up that state when you were feeling um, very smart, for example, or very intelligent or very confident and capable in that situation. And then usually you will like put your thumb and and pointer finger together or some people press on their like press on a knuckle when you you close your eyes and you meditate and you bring yourself into that state of feeling intelligent and capable and smart and then you anchor that with a physical um like actually touching a spot on your body that you wouldn't normally use so something that's a little bit weird like touching your middle knuckle with your pointer finger and then whenever you catch yourself in that thought process of, oh, I'm just stupid. I'll, I can't learn this. I could never learn that. I'm just dumb. You can use that anchor point, like stop, take a few breaths, use that anchor point. And the more you practice doing this, this is something I've been practicing now for probably two or three months for a specific state of being, um, the more you can feel just your body shift or your state shift into something that's more open ended, right? So you could be in a situation where you honestly feel stupid, like maybe you're trying something brand new. And you've never done it before. And everyone else around you is really good. And you're kind of like, oh, I feel so stupid, right? But that's not what we want in in the mind, right? We don't want that because that's limiting that is fixed it's saying this is how i am and i can't change there's no possibility there's no anything outside of that so if you can catch that which is the hard part right the observance of it the separation between who i am as the observer of my thoughts and then what thoughts are actually happening that aren't me that aren't who i am necessarily they're just the thought stream that's going by and so if you can catch one of those things in that moment and then you can say okay, now I want to change my state and I want to be more open. I want to be more um, curious about what I possibly could do. So that's where the anchoring comes in. And that's where installing a new, more growth mindset related statement, like, um, you know, I am intelligent at different things, or I can, I can become smarter the more I practice like one of those group B thoughts, right? Or with hard work and dedication, I can become smart at anything that I want to. And see, that doesn't, that's easy for your mind to latch on to, right? Because it's not saying I'm going to be the smartest in the world, or I'm going to be smarter than this person next to me, or I'm going to be, it's not a competition. It's not saying that, you know, unless I'm the best or I'm getting, you know, some award for being smart in this area, that that's the only measurement. It's like, I can get smarter even by a small increment. And just that is enough to <clears throat> open up the door of possibility for your mind because it's the um, reticular activating system in our mind that when you, like, depending on what statement or question you ask, it's going to go out there and look for that. And I've talked about this, I think, with cars before is one of my favorite examples of how this works. Like if you get a new car or my little one, for example, her favorite car is the Dodge Challenger. And so like, I never noticed, I mean, I would see them on the road before, but I, it never crossed my mind to pay attention. It's not my favorite car, you know, so never really paid that much attention. But ever since it's been probably like a year now that she's been obsessed with this car, she sees them everywhere, you know, so everywhere we go, every time we go for a walk, we go to the park, we get in the car and drive. She's like, mom, look, it's an orange Dodge. It's a red Dodge. And she like screams it out and points and like gets all hyped up about seeing this car. Right. And it's because that's something that her brain is, is like looking for, you know what I mean? Because she has that 
affection for it. And so that's kind of an example of how this works when you start putting things into your mind that you want to see and and wording them in a way that's positive, like we talked about. So not saying, you know, I'm not the thing that you don't want to be or I can't do the thing that you don't want to do. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're completely restructuring that that statement into I am intelligent, right? Or I am capable or in like a nutrition context, um, you know, I, if I get off the wagon, I can get right back on and keep moving forward. I always keep moving forward no matter what happens. Like those kind of statements are encouraging in the moment. And then what that does in your brain is it starts to open up that door of what, well, okay, well, what's possible? How would I get better then? What would I have to learn in order to become smarter at this? Who, what, Who's a mentor I might need to seek out? What book should I read? Maybe who should I follow online to learn more about this? How can I identify how I learn best and incorporate that into how I'm learning so that I can get smarter faster, right? All those, now those are all questions that start popping up in your mind, right? And then you can use those to affirm the statement that you made in the first place, right? Because in two weeks, three weeks, a month later, you can say, from that nutrition context, yeah, I fell off the wagon for whatever reason, but I got right back on and I continued moving forward. And then now, well, and then now you have evidence of that, right? Because you did do that. And again, it doesn't mean that you had to be pursuing perfection. It just means even if you did, an, did incrementally better than the last time you fell off the wagon, you've affirmed that statement that I can do better, I can get right back on, and I can continue moving forward towards my goal. So then if you happen to fall off the wagon again, you already know, okay, I can get right back on, I can continue moving forward. And now you're going to believe that because you have evidence, more and more evidence of that. And it's easier for your brain to latch on to that. And so that's kind of the difference between these group A thoughts that we were talking about um, and if you notice, kind of each one is the opposite of each other. So in the group A, where it says, I'm not good enough, if that's something you hear coming up a lot, you can try to substitute that for the first one from the group B, I can get better with practice. Because sometimes if we say, you know, I am good enough, even though that's true, because I believe that we all are, you know, born that way. But um, it it's, can be kind of hard sometimes for your mind to accept that. And so I find something like saying, you know, I can get better with practice. I can become better is, is easier for your mind to latch on to and a little bit more helpful, at least from my experience. So the second one, I'll probably fail. If that seems to be like the default mode that you go into when you get presented with something challenging, you could try switching that to something like the second one in group B. I'll learn from this. So instead of see seeing failure as I am a failure or this is failing or this isn't working, period, and I'm going to quit, you can say, okay, what happened here? You know, what can I learn from this situation? What do I wish I did better? Yes. But what can I learn and um, improve on for next time? And then your brain's going to go looking for the answer to that question, right? So oftentimes, this is what happens to me, you'll just, stuff will just pop up. You know what I mean? Stuff will just, ideas will just come to you. Your intuition will speak. Um, you know, the higher power, that's where I feel like that very strong connection there. It's like, I will just get these downloads or these ideas or these, these pulls from something that will be like, this is what you need to do next. This is what you need to try. And I'm just learning more and more to trust that if I'm going through this process, right, of pl plucking out those thoughts and I'm like, oh, that's that's my inner critic, that's my inner warrior, that's my inner, you know, anxiety. How much of that is real and how much of that is just that program, right? And then what can I change it to? And then when I change it to that and I start observing feedback, different feedback from my environment, trusting that. So this makes me uncomfortable. Bah! I actually felt uncomfortable coming on here today. I'm kind of just feeling like, you know, blah, and it's cloudy and rainy for like the fourth day. And I'm like, I just kind of want to stay in bed today. But um, I can replace that with challenges help me to grow, right? I know I know when I come on here, I feel great because I like interacting with you guys and I love talking about this stuff. And so even when 
you feel uncomfortable, the, the, the growth of moving through a challenge and progressively challenging yourself with more and more things is extremely rewarding and it helps you to grow into whatever it is you're pursuing. So again, from like a nutrition standpoint, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe trying like kind of example I had trying a new recipe this week, not something I'm super comfortable with because I hadn't really done it before and it involved making the noodles separately and then making sure I had all the other ingredients I don't normally buy. And so it was just like a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. Right. But, and I was kind of tired and I just was like, ah, I don't really feel like going through all this work, but the end result was so cool. And my little one loved it. And I even ate some you guys, cause I had to try it and it was fantastic. So, you know, now I feel much more comfortable and I can work that into my meal prep, make sure I have all those ingredients on hand and, um, getting through that little challenge helped me grow into a more hip ketovore cooking mom, right? Um, so there's kind of some examples of, you know, how you could take anything from that group A and then find its corresponding partner in the group B. And those are examples of how to start installing different thoughts. And this isn't super easy. You know, like I said, I've been, you know, since I started studying this stuff and it's been years, you know, and there's still times in my life where kind of like that third choice, it's like, it depends on the situation, right? Or it depends on kind of what's going on where you'll notice that. But I think the most empowering thing that we can do is learn how to observe that stuff. And that's where prayer and meditation and spirituality and introspection and even in physical fitness, like our mind body exercise, like yoga, or I've been doing Pilates lately and I love it. Or um, one of you brought up Qigong last week. And so any of that stuff that helps you just really connect what's going on in here to your movement through breathing or um, more of a like a mindfulness practice or a spiritual or meditative practice where you're trying to just observe that thought stream going by and kind of disconnect from it. That's the like the tangible tactical thing that starts to facilitate this more. And it's a daily thing, right? I don't I don't believe that I'll probably ever get to monk status in my life. I mean, maybe that's just a limiting belief. But, you know, when you look at people who have trained like their whole lives in meditation, they're able to achieve some pretty incredible things. So we can all practice that to some degree. My dust store is here. Sorry, I'm late. It's okay. And I mean to I always mean to greet anyone from the future who is watching the replay too, but I forget to do that in the beginning. So if you're in the replay here from the future. <laughs> Welcome. Um, Carnivore Keith says, I got a comment from one of my family members who hadn't seen me in eight months. She asked if I had been sick since I had lost so much weight. It triggered me. Why would her first thought be that? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I've heard this before where I think this was maybe from a Dr. Barry video I watched a long time ago where, you know, sometimes people have an idea of what is a healthy weight based on, again, some of these kind of cultural, and I think, yeah, you were talking about like the cultural element, right? Where someone that perhaps is of what would be like more medically considered a healthy BMI or a healthy weight, um, you know, depending on who you're talking to, that might be like too skinny, right? You know, just based on what they are used to seeing and the way they've lived their life and all that kind of stuff. And so, that could be a reason. I don't know if it is the reason, but, um, you know, for someone to, and I, I can't remember how much weight you've lost. I think you mentioned it last time, but, um, it could be kind of shocking for people, you know, that haven't seen you in a long time. And, and if it's like a hundred pounds or even 50 pounds or something like it might trigger some people to think like, Oh, are you okay? You know, it's, it's not, super normal to lose a, a lot of a significant amount of weight in that short of a period. So, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that your, your family member loves and cares about you. And that's probably why, um, she said that, but, you know, again, sometimes it's, it's contextual within what that person thinks is healthy or what they're used to for themselves or where they live or, or whatever that is. And so, um, but that's hard when, you're like, no, I feel great, right? And you're saying it's carnivore. It's the healthiest and happiest I've been in a very long time. And you want, you know, 
we want people to be excited about that too, right? Because we're excited about it. It's like, wow, I feel so much better. I finally lost this weight or I'm finally, like in my case, clearing up some of my inflammation. It's so life-changing to not have to feel bogged down like that every day. Um, you just want to tell people, right? And for them to be happy for you. And so sometimes it's hard when we're discussing this with people that, you know, haven't heard of it or aren't on board for like the more primal ancestral approach to health. Um, that's why we have these groups, right? And these YouTube channels and stuff that we can connect with each other because that's very important. And that's, as a side note, that's something that, um, you know, if I'm being honest, I shied away from community for a long time in this space. And I've, I've mentioned in the past that I had a channel in the past about my first round of carnivore. And I got really like, I just, people started flooding me with comments and, um, you know, just questions I didn't know the answer to. I was like, look, I'm just trying to figure out why everything makes me sick and why I'm sensitive to everything and why I have these gut issues. And I've been on this like 10 year journey, you know, trying all this different stuff. And I just like, I got really overwhelmed and it's, you know, it's different when it's online because you can't see the person and you can't really tell what they mean by what they say. It could be interpreted with, you know, a negative kind of intent or a positive intent, depending on how you read it. So it's a little different online, but you know, I got a lot of like pushback and these really like microbiology questions like, well, how do you know your microbiome isn't going to give you cancer and all this stuff? I'm like, I don't know. All I know is I feel way better than I did before. Like, is that good enough for anyone? So I can identify with that. And it's hard, like, but that experience kind of pushed me away from talking about this and why I think I mentioned when we we hit 10,000 subscribers, I did put up a video and it's like, you know, I have this mixed relationship with the internet and social media and sometimes even being a content creator because, you know, it's hard, it's hard to talk about some of the stuff that's a little more personal, right? Your personal health concerns and stuff and then hear people's feedback. Um, and so I was afraid of that for a long time. And partly it was because of that first experience on YouTube. And and then I have, like, we're talking about limiting beliefs. I have always, since I didn't go to college and really, like, earn a degree, even though I was considered a smart person in high school, I had really good grades. And I've always loved to study. I've always loved to learn. I've been a learner my entire life. But I just never went to a formal college and, and earned a degree in anything because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't want to, like, risk all that money and then end up like not liking it or changing my mind or something like that. And so that has always been in my head, like, well, Nia, you don't know enough. You're not qualified enough. Who would listen to you? That's that kind of group A set of thoughts, right? Where I was always afraid to talk about my, just my experiences and share those because I thought, well, you know, I'm not qualified to do so. I'm not, you know, a health expert. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a biochemist, you know, and I should have in the past, you know, gone and done these things. But what I've realized, you know, and why I feel so grateful for the community that I have now and being able to do live streams like this with you guys and interact is that, you know, that is community is such a huge part of healing and, and having support is so incredibly powerful. And that's something that I really avoided for a long time because I thought I can do it on my own. I don't need anybody's help. You know, I can figure this out by myself. And and there's there's good reasons for trying to do that, right? I'm a firm believer in taking responsibility for your health and learning as much as you can and trying to give advice or, you know, put out the truth, not just kind of spouting off whatever we think about is right, you know, like trying to back it up with some kind of credible evidence, you know, but at the same time, we're all learning through this and the science is not settled. I don't care what anybody tells you, you know, and so this part of the way that we evolve and change and get healthier as a society, you know, no matter where you live on the planet, most of us are unhealthy now, you know, and so it's by doing this stuff. It's by connecting with people. It's by you know, thinking about questions, it's by challenging our beliefs, even within the carnivore, you know, quote unquote dogma, right? Like it's always good to think about different questions and remain open minded to what the possibilities are because, um, you know, 
there's a there's an individual aspect to this and then there's sort of a a human aspect to this right and so there's all kinds of stuff to think about and i guess i'm i'm beating i'm I'm hitting a bunch of angles here but um community is so important and i'm so grateful that i have all of you guys now uh, gentlemen and ladies here to talk to and get your feedback and share what I'm going through. And that's why I'm posting now more weekly updates because that helps keep me motivated to stay on plan. But it also keeps me transparent with you um, showing that, you know, I'm not perfect and I'm not always doing this perfect and I don't always adhere a hundred percent to my goals perfectly, but that's life. You know what I mean? And I think one of the most important aspects of doing this too and and changing any mindset thoughts too it's like you're not going to do one affirmation one day and then your mindset's changed for the rest of your life right like you're going to have days where you slip off the eating plan you're going to have days where those negative thoughts come back in you're going to have days where that one situation that always triggers you just gets to you you know and that's where coming back to a community of supportive like-minded people is so important and that's what i was missing that's really the biggest element that I was missing in my journey for so long because I hid this from so many people, even the very closest people in my life because I was embarrassed and I, you know, I felt ashamed, you know, of how, you know, I was behaving in some in some ways and um, how I would give in to temptation and how I would just not be taking good care of myself, but yet trying to be on this health journey. And so it was like very complicated. Right. But. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so there's a lot there, but I never had a community of people that really understood what I was, what I was going through. And so, <clears throat> sorry, I just have this frog. It's my co-host. <clears throat> um, yeah. So community and that's, so that's, what's different now. And I find that super encouraging and I'm grateful for all your helpful comments and participation and stuff like this because that's that's what's going to keep us all on the wagon in the long term together, right? And and like I, I was just having this discussion with somebody else this week about, you know, we know what we know right now, just like our parents knew what they knew at the time when they were raising us and their parents did the same. It's like if you if you have the best intentions for your own health and for your kids, then then it's part of what I think naturally happens is just to continue learning. And if you learn new information, then you adapt and you change and you, you know, tweak whatever you're doing to fit the new information. Right. And so we don't have to stick to a dogma of like 100% strict carnivore for everyone in the house, no matter what birthdays, birthday parties, whatever, nothing, you know, like maybe for some people that's necessary because of their health concerns or because of the way their situation is. But you know, like in my situation, for me, I need to be strict carnivore because I, if I try to add anything plant back in, it's like inflammation zone. You know what I mean? And so that's just how it is for me. And I've accepted that, but I also have to be flexible enough to say, okay, well, my three-year-old doesn't necessarily need to do that. It's not that it's bad for her, but if she likes, you know, olives and whatever, like, different things, then she can have that sometimes as long as they're whole food and ancestrally appropriate, you know, for most of the time. So anyway, I know that was like a tangent, but community, you know, and then we have each other to support and learn from throughout this process. Like, I really love connecting with other moms and families who are trying to do this too, because, you know, it's just, we all love our kids and we want them to flourish, right? We want them to be strong and, um, capable and reach their potential. And so we're just trying to do, do all that. Okay. So I'm going to go through some of your comments here. See, we got some more people. Um, Carverkey says, appreciate your answer. Yeah. Thanks for that question. And I, I know that can be frustrating dealing with other people sometimes. Um, bread and butter says carnivore is amazing. I've never felt better. Love this community. Thanks, Nia. Awesome. You're welcome. And I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad, you know, we're all just figuring this out because I've never felt better either. And I continue, continue to do so. Um, 
Ruth Elizabeth says, I went on carnivore for health, still have chronic fatigue and poor sleep, but working on it. No more severe cramps that I would get every day. Also quit alcohol bonus. Yeah, I um, I can totally identify with that. That's pretty much where I am. Although I wouldn't say I have chronic fatigue anymore. It's gotten much better after I cut out coffee. Um, even limiting decaf, which still has a teeny bit of caffeine. Um, and I also got off alcohol, which helps. And um, just in case you haven't seen any of my recent updates, I did Lion for, for January, 30 out of the 31 days. And then I decided like, you know, I thought that was good, but I just wanted more info. So February, I'm actually tracking my macros because I was still kind of struggling with energy. I had like three, four, five days where I'd feel really good. And then I just like feel like I was crashing again and my sleep was a little bit off too. And so I've tracked and I just published my first week update yesterday. And, you know, newsflash, I have not been eating nearly enough fat this whole time. Like I thought, oh, I'm at 70, 80%. And this week of like actually intentionally trying to eat high fat, like eating tablespoons of tallow with my meat and stuff, I only got to like 73% approximately fat. And so that was kind of like, oh, okay, I just need to like try to really up my fat. And the more I'm doing that, the better I'm feeling. So not sure if that will work for you. Um, but it's just something to think about when, um, you know, looking at what you might want to do to move forward, like really see like, what are your macros? And when that changes, does that affect any of these things? Um, Elena says, um, especially coming from parents, they immediately assume anything bad is because I eat meat and therefore my body lacks vitamins. Yeah, this is, it's just hard. I like your hair color, by the way. It's like very similar, I like that pastel color. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. And, and again, like we just want to share this stuff because we're feeling so much better and we want other people to feel better. Right. But just not everybody's open to it. And, you know, for me, that's just something I've had to accept and just, I stop pushing it. I stop even kind of bringing it up sometimes because, um, I feel like if like everyone knows that I do this, you know, and so if they had a question, they can ask me and I'd be more than happy to talk about it. But, um, I try not to bring it up just me personally, just because it kind of just, you know, doesn't go anywhere sometimes. Um, Kelly says my hormones were crazy before I went carnivore in a week, I felt more stable and happy. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm still working on it. But, uh, you know, definitely noticing changes. And I had to I had to cut the caffeine. The caffeine was just messing with me hard. Uh, Elena says it's not about changing their mind. Your life is proof. Your blood tests are proof. They chose to believe it or not. Right. I believe that. I think doing our best just to model good health and continue to improve and and as we learn more we you know make adjustments and just trying to do our best and improving our own health is the, is the best proof i believe that um let's see rob says all the medical industry does is test test symptoms and not root problem yes that's highly frustrating too when you're trying to find a practitioner or somebody to work with that um, you can actually be on a team with, you know, and I actually saw right before I came on here, Dr. Barry published a video about, um, finding a carnivore, ketivore friendly doctor. And there's a bunch of links in there. I usually check from time to time, but I haven't really found anything in my area. However, I'm sure every day there's more and more. Um, let's see any other questions. Copper's Carnivore Kitchen. Hey, greetings from Alaska. Happy to catch you live. Thanks for being here. I see you um, <clears throat> around and let's see, where did, where is you last? Maybe Christie's show? I can't remember. Um, nice to see you. Thanks for coming in. Kelly says, uh, my kids love me. We're also a hunting family. My son was thrilled about going carnivore. That's so cool. I, um, I've never really hunted at all. Um, and that's something that I think is a skill probably we should all have. Right. So that's very cool. And, um, yeah, learning how to process your own stuff. We, uh, a place I used to live 
there was um, a friend of mine who was like starting a farm kind of and and he started learning how to process like the the um, beef from his um, like live his own livestock essentially is what I'm trying to say. Um, that's really the closest I have to anything like that. But that's very cool. United Carnivore, the more you lose yourself in something bigger than the self, yourself, the more energy you will have. I really like that. Yep. If I could, you know, put my long-winded rantings into a one-sentence thing, I think that that would be a good way to summarize it, right? Because there again, like when you have a transformation like so many of us have, that's why we get so excited and we want to tell other people, but then not everybody wants to hear or isn't on board for it or, you know... So it's, those can be difficult situations, right? And so I find that same thing to be true where if I can kind of lose myself in thinking about, you know, what's my bigger purpose in a more general sense? Like what, what is my, how can I be of service more? Like something that's a little more abstract in that sense versus like, who can I personally talk to about this? It it really, and I don't know if that's exactly what you're going for, United Carnivore, but that's kind of how I feel. Or if I can broaden it out and paint a bigger picture of what impact I would like to have in a positive way, that's that's very encouraging when when you might be feeling discouraged about some of these more like person-to-person -person interactions. Um, let's see, we got about four minutes before we're on the hour. And I, you know, I kind of went off the journal prompt thing today. I had a couple worksheets that, um, I was going to walk through a little bit, which to be honest, we kind of talked about most of this stuff in the mindset part, but, um, I will leave you with a couple prompts to at the end here, but I'm just going to see if Rob says coffee can deplete our nutrients in our bodies. Yeah, I believe that. And I didn't really know that for a long time until I started reading up, you know, the second time I got on carnivore more about coffee and it's like, yeah, definitely true. So it could be why my electrolytes were off or, you know, not absorbing what I'm eating as much because I was drinking a lot of coffee. Oh, Ruth says, um, yeah, it's going to try to get more fat. I will track also the coffee. I will cut down and then try without. Yeah, it's, that was hard to give up, but I just slowly started I put a jar of grounds next to my coffee pot. And so it started out, it was full caffeine. And then I would just kind of start mixing decaf in and slowly bringing my caffeine down like over about four weeks. And then in December, I made it like to almost all decaf. I was still having like a smidge of caffeine in the afternoons, sometimes in the morning, but very rarely. And then January, I was like, rip the bandaid off. Let's take it all out. So yeah, definitely go, I would go easy on it if I had to suggest anything. Um, PL Diablo says, bone broth, also buco, great for everything. Our brains need fat to function well. And memories, yes. Um, I made some chuck roast soup this week with some like big hefty marrow bones. So I started the broth and did that like 24 hours and then, um, you know, chopped up some chuck roast, seared them on the stove and then put them in there and, it, and it's really good. Yeah, and little one likes that too. She loves broth, which is cool. All right, we've got time for a few more. Lust Junk More Health says, one thing I've noticed is a stark difference between the carnivore community and the vegan community. Not all vegans, just militant vegans. I followed both before. I really appreciate everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I got a comment kind of related to this the other day about, you know, I think it was on my super long healing journey video where it was like, you know, something to the effect of, well, you know, vegan work f works for other people. And so just live and let live. And, you know, please don't say that one's better than the other kind of a thing. And I thought, you know, in this context, I'm like, I just, I think all of us in this space, like we probably all think, okay, this is the better way to eat, right? An ancestrally appropriate eating pattern macro types of foods that we're eating is better, right, for our species. However, um, you know, I think it's fair that we don't um, demonize the other side, right? Like, and I always 
keep bringing up Dr. Berry today, but I like the way he puts it because it's like, you know, a lot of times people go on plant-based or vegan diets for a lot of the same health reasons that we end up carnivore, right? That's why I went plant-based and tried vegan a long time ago is because I thought it's healthy, right? And it's going to fix my gut and do all this stuff. Unfortunately, I got way sicker and felt way worse, you know, but I don't, you know, I understand why people are attracted to that. And I also agree that it can become like sort of hyper-religious, right? Where it's, it's like very ethically based. And in my personal opinion, those ethics are not well-grounded. I mean, it's not like vegan diets don't kill animals or they don't create pollution or they don't, you know, foster all this kind of other, um, like unhealthy, the things that they are kind of claiming are unhealthy about meat production and pollution and climate and all these things, like all of the agriculture affects that too. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's not this moral high ground with which uh, I feel many, perhaps, you know, I don't know, most, I don't know the number, but um, people feel when they go on that diet, it's like, oh, I'm being healthy, but I'm also doing something for the greater good when it comes to this. And so again, I don't say, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's great to aspire to, right? But um, does it actually do the things that they're claiming it does? And is it actually making people healthier? Is it helping their mental health? Is it doing all that stuff? I would personally disagree. I would say that the, um, from my personal experience and based on thousands of other comments that I've read, um, you know, an ancestral proper human diet, keto to, you know, lion is appropriate for most people. Um, or I guess I would say all people anyway. So yeah, there's a difference sometimes in the messaging and the, the fervor with which people espouse things. And then like what that's based on, is it based on pure ethics you know, and it's like, well, if it's not healthy for us, that's okay because it's for this other purpose or is it, you know, so like there's differences there. Um, and I noticed that too. And I appreciate everybody in this community as well. Cause I feel like, you know, for the most part, people here are pretty open-minded, you know, we've either been there, done that on the opposite spectrum, or we see like the things that I just pointed out where it's like, we're all trying to figure out how to get healthy, right? We're all trying to figure out what the best way is to do. And as long as we keep approaching this with an open mind, we can get there. So um, yeah, thanks for that comment. Okay, I have to go. Let's see. Thanks everybody for being here. Sorry I didn't get to everybody's comment. <laughs> I see some funny ones here. <laughs> Yeah, and it's political too. Unfortunately, freaking everything's political now, and I tr I try to stay as far away from that as I can because it's just it's just another div divisive tactic, right? You know, it's just another way to divide people and force us to choose one thing or the other. When you know, there there are there are points on both sides that need to be considered, and so I think yeah, it's it's unfortunate when things get so hyper attached to politics that we again we can't separate them out and then that will blind us right to what is really right for us to do at the end of the day and so anyway i hope that made sense so i guess really the main journal prompt that i will leave you guys with to to think about today based on our conversation is to identify that inner critic's personality because there's kind of like four categories that this this inner critic might um, fall into and this will help you be better able to identify and kind of pluck out those thoughts like we were talking about and then um, the part b to this question would be to you know list some of those thoughts and then um, figure out ways like we discussed in here to to rewrite those statements in a positive way that's also acceptable enough and believable enough to your mind that they will actually start um, working for you so that you can build up that evidence, right? Like I did do this. I did become smarter. I did get right back on the wagon, those types of things. So the four categories or kind of personalities of your inner critic, inner critic could be number one, the warrior, warrior, W-O-R-R-I-E-R. -R -E um, 
this critic points out everything that can or could go wrong, stirs up emotions of anxiety and fear by imagining disasters, expecting the worst and overestimating the odds of something bad happening. So this tends to be like, what if this happens? What if that happens? Like worrying. Number two is the critic. So constantly judging and evaluating your behavior, pointing out all of your flaws, jumps on any mistake you make and reminds you of how you may have failed in the past compares you to others and assumes that other people are going to judge you and tends to minimize your accomplishments. So you might hear things like, you're an idiot, something like that. Number three is the victim. It tells you that you're hopeless, you're not making progress, or that things are too hard. It tells you there's something wrong with you, you're unworthy, you're incapable, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, too many obstacles, things like that. It's not my fault. You tend to hear things like, I can't. And then the last one is the perfectionist, which pushes you to do better even when, but even when you do better, you still feel like you're not good enough. So there's always something you should be doing more, um, trying to avoid mistakes and setbacks because that is some kind of sign that you're not doing it right or you're not good enough. Um, a lot of times this, you know, Personality will seek external validation, achievement, or status, or acceptance from others as reinforcement that, like, I'm good enough, I'm, I'm perfect enough type of thing. Tends to say things like, I need to do better, or I'm not good enough. So all of, um, so it's kind of useful to identify, like, what category you, you feel like your mindset can fall into sometimes. And then we talked about ways to observe that more and um, then writing down these affirmative statements and practicing saying those a good time frame is like seven days to um, you know write three four five of them down and every time you catch one like say them to yourself in the morning when you wake up and then before you go to bed and then every time you catch one you can go back to this little sticker on your whiteboard or whatever you have and just say hey I can do better even if I make a mistake I can get smarter with hard work the more I apply myself, the better I will be, you know what I mean? Or whatever it is that you write. And so that's how we can kind of begin to go from a fixed perspective or a fixed mindset on something into more of a growth mindset, which opens up opportunity and ultimately success for our goals. So, okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. I appreciate all of you. And check out the links in my description for the live stream workbook if you want to follow along every week. And my goal setting workbook, which again is free if you sign up for my newsletter. And have a great week. I'll be publishing a recipe video this week and more updates on high fat macros and tracking. So take care, everybody.